sharing information from like training sessions like on the way to fixtures other stuff that isn't necessarily kind of big sexy complete final things and show people um, some of that kind of behind the scenes stuff so then I wanted to look a little bit about structuring content and um, when I was thinking about this I was struck by a revelation I was lied to at school so when I was at school, I was taught that stories have a beginning, a middle and an end. So, you know, once upon a time, this thing happened, then this other thing happened, and then there's this kind of big dramatic ending. Um, and so that for unions or for um, student opportunities, that might look like this. So um, five years ago, we were granted funding to set up a pilot project. And then it was really, really successful. So we repeated it the following year, kind of added some bits in. Um, and yeah, it was really, really good. Um, and then, you know, you can sign up to be part of it. Uh, this year, the deadline's next month. So like beginning, like way, way back in the history, then the middle, some stuff changed and we developed, and then the end, which is kind of the stuff that's happening now. But if you're writing news, <laughs> you kind of need to do it, that's completely wrong because you're actually starting there with the least important bit. So with this, my key message would be um, sign up for this thing, it's great. Um, but like, there's nothing even about how it was great in that beginning, at least in the middle, you know, it kind of went well. And then at the end, the most important bit, which is you can sign up for that, is tucked away right at the end. And so if you flip this around, this becomes what is known as the journalism inverted triangle. So this is how you write news. You start with the most important bits. So that's the key facts, that key message. So when we talked about how it's so important, it's so important that we're going to put it right in the opening. And then after that, you have some stuff that's you know it's helpful, it's good, you know, context, um, some interesting bits, but it's not it's not vital. And then right at the end, you can have some extra stuff, but to be honest, you could probably delete that. So taking my example, we'd start with sign up to this thing with deadlines next month, then some context about how it's, you know, it's really great and it's great. And then if we need to, we could put some stuff in about how it first started. Um, but we've really flipped that around. And you can actually do it with fairy tales. Um, so when I run um, this training uh, as part of like a, a longer session, I give out fairy tales to people and we rewrite them. So a lot of fairy tales start with, you know, um, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water um, but we flip them around and so we start with you know um, young person fall you know involved in terrible um, mountain fall and then we kind of go back and work our way backwards so yeah basically yeah I was lied to in school shocking revelation and so if you're writing news so maybe that's an announcement of something that you've got coming up or you know you're putting together like a blog post or something to go online make sure you're putting that it's you know the most important key message right up at the front because that's the most important bit and it relates to how people read online compared to how they read offline so if you think about you know you, you are probably similar if i'm sitting reading something on my phone, I'm scrolling through things, I'm probably also watching TV, I've got, you know, I'm thinking about a million things, probably sat on the bus, it's loud, it's noisy. Um, whereas reading offline is often very different and it really affects how we process information and how we read things. And so this is an example of some um, lorem ipsum, which is a very technical term for filler text. And this is one of my favorite types of lorem ipsum. This is dog lorem, doggo lorem ipsum. So this is just like, imagine that this is text. So we've got this kind of long headline and then these kind of big chunky paragraphs and information. So this could be about um, a new campaign we're launching or you know a match report or um, a kind of preview of a concert that's coming up. And this is often the sort of stuff that I see. Um, because you know you're really enthusiastic about what you're writing about so people write these kind of really lengthy things but it, that's quite hard to read it's quite dense it doesn't look very exciting so this is a new uh, you know taking the same kind of concept and thinking particularly for writing online so we've made the headline is much shorter uh, we've highlighted uh, key points 
we've put in some subheadings there's some bullet points and we've made the most of it being online so we link to other information um we've put, embedded a video and got that really sad looking picture of a dog um when i share these slides you'll be able to click through and watch the video yourself it's basically a compilation of cute puppy moments which um yeah you can say it's uh, important volunteer uh, staff development to watch it but i think this shows the difference if i jump back to the previous slide that if people are looking at stuff online this kind of broken up version with subheadings is just so much easier to read because people can jump down see the bit that's most relevant and they say that when people read online they read in like an f shape so your eyes um, go down the margin and then they dart across like the headings and the subheadings so those things like breaking up like that really helps um, and people yeah can kind of skim down and see the bits that are most relevant to them then um, I really, really love um, a pointless acronym. And this one is useful, I think, for promoting stuff uh, to students who are busy. There's loads of stuff going on and loads of people are trying to talk to them. So it's this kind of four letter acronym. So if you are putting together um, a, an Instagram post or a poster or you're kind of planning a talk, these are the steps that you need. So you need something that gets their attention. So that might be through like a bold design, that might be a catchy headline. That's something, you know, maybe you do like a flash mob or a stunt that gets people's attention. Um, but you need to do something to stand out and kind of make them look. And then you need to get them interested. So you really want to then kind of make them curious, make so that they will want to listen. So maybe, you know, put some interesting statistics in or, you know, like there's maybe a, uh, an image that's kind of interesting, curious, you think, oh, what is that? Then you want to make them care. So you want to, um, yeah, get them to um, get them their kind of desire involved. So maybe that's how you explain, you know, why this thing is a great injustice or why this is such an exciting opportunity um, for them to be involved. And then you, need, you want to make them do something. So you need to end with an action. So that's how you can explain what to do. And in marketing, we call that a call to action. So you would um, have, a, usually it starts with a verb. So sign this, buy this, do this, um, and make it easy for them to do that. So if you're saying, you know, join our society, then I like, add the link for them to sign up online or explain how they can do that. So you make it really easy for people. But yeah, you really want to, you're kind of hooking them in. It's, it's pulling them down this funnel. And then you give them that call to action that gives them something to do. Now that you've got their attention, got them interested and you make them care. And um, one thing I like to do with people, uh, um, so I've got this challenge for you and you can answer in the um, chat box uh, if you make sure it's saying all panelists and attendees. Basically, I'm going to perform a song for you. Did do music A level, that will not be noticeable from my performance. But yeah, I'm going to perform this song and you definitely know it. And so the challenge for you is when you know what this song is, um, put it in the chat box. And you, you definitely know this song, like everyone knows this song. It's really, really obvious. Um, so here we go, this is quite embarrassing, I can't believe I'm about to do this. But anyway, Here's my performance. So yeah, when you know what the song is, pop it in the chat box um, for everyone to see. So here we go. Okay, so Joe and Ben, okay, you got it. Um, that's happy birthday. And once you know that, it's really obvious. And I um, mean, yeah, it probably is those uh, grade seven piano uh, coming into play there, my expert performance. But my point is, I can do it in a room full of people, and there'll always be a couple of people that get it, clearly Joe and Ben, smart cookies. Um, but there's also a bunch of people that are looking at you like, I mean, partly like, why is that woman clapping at us? That's a bit weird. But also like getting really frustrated because they don't understand it. And actually, as more and more people start going like, I know what that is, it's even more annoying for them. Um, and the reason I have just embarrassed myself on the internet to a virtual room full of people, it's because when you're really familiar with something, it seems, stuff seems really obvious to you and you forget that other people don't know that. Because if I now did that again and said to you, this is happy birthday, you'd be like, oh yeah, no, there it is. Yeah, I've got it. But before that, you could be like, I don't know what on earth is happening or like, why do other people know that? And I think when we, 
love something like we love our society or our campaign or kind of our officer portfolio and we spend a lot of time thinking about it we're really familiar with it but it's easy to forget that other people don't know that so this is an example um, of something that uh, is the sort of thing we probably did say when I worked at Sussex um, and so yeah maybe that's on a post or an email or something and that's the sort of thing that um, we could do and I've seen student groups do similar They'll talk about meeting in meeting in Farmer or meeting in Russell's Clump. And to be honest, even if you do go to Sussex, you probably don't know what those things are. Um, and so these words here have highlighted some that are things that would stand out as just being like, what is that? Might as well be another language. And um, so make sure that when you're talking about things that people will understand what that is. So even things like talking about a social, to a lot of students, they wouldn't know what that means. Like, what, what, what is that a good thing? Do we, like, so make sure that the words you use are really clear, particularly, you know, if um, you're, you know, maybe give people directions to explain how to get somewhere. Um, if people are new to a university or new to your sport or new to, you know, so many things, don't forget that it's the equivalent of you, like, <laughs> frantically clapping happy birthday at them, being like, come on, why don't you get this? and they won't necessarily know what that is so make sure that you're not using kind of weird university or activity specific jargon um, and also yeah like just weird phrases that um, maybe if english isn't your first language or you're just not so familiar with something just wouldn't make sense and one thing i'm gonna quickly talk about media law and in fact i don't think i am gonna make reference to sexual violence um, but I'm not a lawyer, not a media law expert, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things that are more likely to be relevant for officers and for people involved in some campaign activities um, and then some stuff that will be relevant to everyone. Um, and it's just a couple of things for you that you might need to be aware of when you're kind of communicating about what you do. Um, this is like going to be such a quick blitz through, so if you want to talk about this, um, there are some other media law sessions as part of the um the festival so keep an eye out for them or ping me an email but basically um there is a risk if you are and this is wildly oversimplifying it but like putting like putting together videos or stuff anything that makes someone look bad um that uh you could be accused of uh defamation and my topical example is the Colleen Rooney, Rebecca Vardy uh, trial is, uh, yeah, she, Colleen's now being sued for libel. And this is particularly if you are like a campaigning group um, or some officer campaigns can sometimes stray into this territory. So those would be things to keep an eye out for. Um, also contempt of court, if you're covering anything to do with um, it's like people being arrested or the law or trials, and in particular um, around sexual offences, that's some stuff to be um, careful with. Again, won't apply to most people, I just wanted to mention it. But one that will apply to uh, a lot of you is copyright. So I'm just curious if anyone here owns the copyright to anything, um, pop it in the chat box if anyone here, anyone owns the copyright. So we've got um, 84 people at the moment, I'd be interested to know how many of those 84 own the copyright to anything, anyone? Uh, oh, cut, oh, so Jordan does. Molly might do. So, okay, that's not too bad. Uh, Molly's, uh, spoiler alert, spoiled my good point, Neve, maybe. So, yes, Molly's completely correct. Um, you all, I'm sure, own the copyright to something because you automatically get copyright when you make something. So if you've ever taken a photo um, or, like, written some stuff, hurrah congratulations you came to this thinking you'd just pick up some marketing tips and you're leaving with the knowledge that you own the copyright to loads of stuff so you're welcome um, my favorite is the um original dramatic work musical work i should my uh, my performance earlier probably probably doesn't qualify but yeah you all own the copyright to loads of things um it's completely automatic there's not like a list, you don't have to kind of file for it or fill in a form, you have to label it, it's kind of automatic when you make a thing. And if you do that as an employee, your employer owns the copyright, or if you're a volunteer or a freelancer, um, that belongs to you. 
Um, so if you are, um, yeah, like writing for your paper, uh, unless you've signed something to the country, you are the copyright owner. And you can, um, uh, yeah, you can uh, license that to other people. So uh, you can um, like give other people permission to do things and share things like with Creative Commons license, but yeah, you own the copyright automatically. And that means that all the stuff you see, someone owes a copyright to that. So if you are just taking random pictures off the internet, um, then you are potentially breaching the copyright. And I do see this quite regularly, um, particularly with student media, but lots of different types of student groups, where they've, um, usually it's a photo online, they found something that's great and they want to use that example. And so they you know, put it on their materials, put it on their website or social media, um, and copyright owners can come after you for sometimes quite large sums of money. So it's just worth being really careful that in your desire, I hope now, to be, um, yeah, like making all sorts of things and creating things that you don't inadvertently end up making quite an expensive uh, mistake by uh, basically nicking someone's picture. So just because something's online doesn't mean that you can definitely use it. Um, and I have got some um, tips for where you can get um, images and stuff for free that um, are totally fine to use. But before that, I wanted to talk a little bit about inclusion and accessibility. I mean, like all the things I'm talking about today, there's so much to this topic, but I wanted to show you just a couple of really useful resources. So the first um, is this um, set of posters, and I've popped the link in the chat box in case you want to dig these out. So these are created um, by the government's um, design team. Um, and they actually have a really good blog on accessibility. It's really worth having a look at. And these are posters that are um, designing um, largely visual, but kind of layout stuff as well for people with various kind of specific needs. So that's definitely worth having a look at so that you can make sure that the things that you produce are um, usable and useful by um, the largest number of people. And I'd, yeah, like I said, I definitely recommend looking at their blog. They focus on digital because it's from their kind of web uh, content teams. But I guess one kind of uh, key message uh, is that it's important not to rely on one particular format. So if you're doing a video, for instance, which will use um, some visual stuff and sound, if someone is talking, it's important to have subtitles or a transcript so that someone who can't hear that can also access that. And obviously that's useful for people who can't put the sound on, maybe they're somewhere that's really loud or there's someone's really quiet. Um, so those subtitles also help for other things too. Um, but yeah, just don't rely on one format because different people um, need different things. And looking more at kind of lang the language and images we use, obviously we want to make sure that we're you know, avoiding assumptions and generalizations. And you can do that through you know, using inclusive language and images. And again, there are some um, examples there of different image sources, because sometimes when you look at like stock photo collections, um, you find they're not very diverse. They, they feature a kind of, you know, a very specific type of person. So there are some suggestions there of other places that you can look um, that will make this stuff available to you. Um, then looking more specifically at particular channels, I wanted to talk about social media because I think it's the most um, common and easiest uh, way for people to communicate. But people don't always understand that just because you put something on social media, it doesn't necessarily mean people will see it. So most of the platforms use um, their own kind of super secret algorithm that decides what people should see. Um, and these are some of uh, the things that people have thought about the Facebook algorithm like for the time. So they will more likely to show you stuff that's more recent. So that's why you don't see something from like three weeks ago. You see something from three hours ago, maybe in your feed. And affinity is to do with like the connection. So if I, as someone whose posts I often like or I often share or um, we just seem to interact a lot, I'm more likely to see that than like some random person I went to school with who, you know, we, you know, I've not even like clicked on their stuff once in several years. And also there are particular formats. So for instance, Facebook went through a period of really liking um, when people use Facebook Live. So that stuff would appear much more frequently. 
Um, but I think the main thing is that they're looking for relevance. If you think of it from their point of view, social media platforms want you to keep using them and to spend more time there. So they they think that if they show you stuff that's really relevant to you, that you'll like, that's yeah, that kind of connects to your interests, then you'll spend more time there. So that's why this idea of being really relevant, which I started off talking about, is useful here as well, because that's what is gonna show your stuff to more people. Um, and Instagram, I've seen more and more student groups using Instagram um, and more offices and unions. And I think this would be probably the place that I would spend, um, start putting more and more of my effort into because it's so easy and um, features in particular in stories like the polls and the Q&A are really, really gr good in terms of the engagement and the response that they get. So I definitely encourage you to try those because you could put the same kind of question maybe on Twitter or on Facebook and probably get nothing. So you put it in an Instagram story and you'll get, you're more, far more likely to get responses and input from people. And the visual, because it's obviously like a really visual um, platform, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't rely on people having a really uh, kind of confident use of English. So it's uh, a bit more inclusive in that way as well. And I think it's worth trying things like paying some money for adverts. I definitely use this is something I encourage unions to do because it's really effective and targeted. But actually, if you know, if you would have spent money, particularly pre-COVID, on like getting some posters printed, you could spend the same amount of money or probably less on some targeted adverts. And then you know how many people are seeing them. You know, um, it's just people from your university or your college. Um, because it allows you to target and say, yeah, I only want to show this to people who say they're at my university, or I only want to show it to people who are interested in football. Um, and you really don't have to spend much money. You can, you know, you could spend like three pounds. We're not talking like massive budgets, but that's really effective. Um, so I think you could try it. Um, and then something, a format that's really easy to do, and I think would be particularly good with the run up to Freshers Week, the um, Welcome Week is the Instagram story template. So these examples come from Canva. Um, so you could fill in your own things, but maybe, you know, put, if you are a, um, a music group, maybe you could, you know, have something where people list their favorite bands or their favorite um, gigs they've ever been to, their favorite songs. It's a great way for people to get to know you and your group. It's um, another way to help people connect with other people with that same interest um, and yeah, meet other people. So that format I think would work really well and is really easy to do. And I promised you some stuff for on um, different images. Um, so these are some good examples. So Canva has stuff built in um, or Unsplash is a really good website to use for free stuff. That's where I get my, that's where I get my dog pictures from. There is a sentence I never thought I'd say in a professional context. Um, but obviously, because we said you get the copyright of anything that you make, another easy option is to take your own photos. And if you are doing that, um, quite often you know, people will stand you know, on the sidelines or kind of at the back of something and try and really fit everything into their photo. Actually, I think often the best photos come when you kind of go in close and find where the action is um, and go for a close up of something rather than a kind of big empty hall or a big empty um, space. So go to where the action is, go for that close up. And if you um, have the option, daylight photos are normally the best ones. And you really don't need fancy equipment. Um, so you, it's totally fine to take pictures on your phone. Um, if you want to get it fancier, maybe get a tripod so that stuff isn't kind of wobbly. Um, you can get a, a reflector to help kind of bounce some light around. You could maybe um, switch up to like a proper camera, make a proper camera with some nice lenses. Maybe you can be super fancy and get some proper lights in. And to edit stuff, again, you can do that on your phone. You could, you know, just edit stuff directly in Instagram um, or other apps. There's stuff online. Um, and there are things, it's worth checking to see if you get any free um, software through your university as well. Um, I know certainly at Sussex um, students have access to um, kind of things like the Adobe suite. So it's worth checking those out um, to get some free stuff. And similarly with video, that's such a good tool. Again, particularly now, particularly now with, you know, we can't really see each other in person. Video is a great way to really like demonstrate what you do and to introduce people. And you really don't have to be afraid. It doesn't have to be technical. So um, I don't know if you'll remember this example, 
but I really liked um, the videos that Rory Stewart made as part of the Conservative leadership campaign. So these were really short videos who had subtitles, they were clearly shot on a phone, they were pretty wobbly, they were not like high production value things. But they, you know, they were about him and talking to people and to, you know, going to where people were and talking to them. And they felt really authentic in that way. Um, and um, I will share a really good article that talks about how they work really well as well. I'll dig that out. Um, and again, with video equipment, it really doesn't have to be fancy or expensive. Um, you can just use your phone. A tripod is handy if you're doing video just because, yeah, you don't get that kind of wobbly stuff happening. Um, maybe you can get a, little, uh, like a cheap microphone and plug it in and again you can kind of work your way up to use more um, fancy equipment if you want. I really hope there aren't any like student TV people watching this going like she is so wrong. Um, but if you are editing stuff just basic things like iMovie on your phone or KineMaster um, you can work your way up to fancier formats if you want um, and often actually you can do particularly with video or animation you can find people who can do stuff like really cheap and kind of uh, adequately well on places like Fiverr to do stuff for you. So I just wanted to wrap up with a few um, design bits um, because I think there are some basic design principles that you can learn. You really don't have to be like some super creative person to make um, some kind of clear and useful um, graphics for people. Um, so Canva, which is the online software, which is really good and free um, to do design. They have their own design school, so you can um, learn basics from them. And they have um, their own kind of templates. These are some examples uh, that are available completely for free. And then you can use these in creative ways. So for instance, maybe you could make some virtual backgrounds for people. So yeah, they can't, you can't have the kind of a normal match day atmosphere but maybe you could have um, you could all share the same background and it's then it's like you're being there um, and then the final thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, web stuff because groups quite often want to make their own websites which is brilliant but I wanted to just point out that most of you will already have access to do things like sell tickets and sell merchandise like t-shirts and things keep track of your members like embed photos and videos because most unions have all this stuff and it's totally free there's no transaction fees usually for them so before you go off and kind of try and make something separate it's worth asking about what facilities they have that you can use and for most unions the period from the middle of august to say the start middle of, of October is when their websites get the most traffic and certainly when I was at Sussex the area that got the most traffic beyond the home page was the list of clubs and societies so even if you don't use this website even if you you know all it is is a link to somewhere else make sure that it's really good and it's accurate and it's up to date because it's about to get like loads and loads of eyeballs looking at it so it's really worth having a look so um, that's everything that I wanted to share. It's been a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour through things. Um, as I said at the start, I'm going to be um, sharing the slides. I'll pop them on Twitter, um, where I'm just, I'm Joe Walters, you can find me there. Um, so I'll share those, or you can just drop me an email and I'll send them over to you. Um, but if you've got any questions, um, you can pop them into the Q&A box. Um, so if you've had a question about whether it's worth buying the pro version of Canva, um, it's worth looking at, they do a free version for not-for-profits. I'm not sure if individual groups would qualify. Most unions probably do, essentially. Um, I've never paid for it. I find the free stuff is um, good enough for what I use it for. Um, occasionally I'll pay like one or two dollars just for like a particular image if I want it. Um, but I think for most, um, certainly most student groups, I don't think it's probably uh, worth um, doing that I think that's kind of um, it's not it's not necessary um, for most student groups um, but yeah so if you ha anyone has got any other questions feel free to drop them into the Q&A box um, as I said um, I'm running these free 30 minute chats there's a whole bunch of different consultants are available to chat um, I've dropped the link into the chat for if you want to book a session with me um, to talk about anything in particular um, 
but uh, yeah, that's everything that I was going to share today. So thank you very much for coming along. Um, I'm going to head over to the coffee shop now. Um, so we're going to be on table one. Um, so feel free to head over there. Um, I've just been asked to share the sites with more diverse stock images, um, so I'll pop that in as well. But yeah, I'll sit here for a little while longer if you want to stay and chat, um, and then we'll head over to the coffee shop. But yeah, thank you very much for coming along. <laughs>